coming up on this edition of the Center of It All. We check out open mic night at the Gamble Mill, get you ready for the first snowfall of the season with a trip to Tussie Mountain, and prepare you for the Black Friday frenzy. These stories and more coming up next on the Center of It All. Hey guys, thanks for joining us on the Center of It All. Now starving artists are always looking for a venue to showcase their talents. And the Gamble Mill in Belfont created an open mic night just for that. Central Pennsylvania is full of talented musicians. From jazz to country and even the blues. If you go out in the area, chances are you're experiencing live music. The Gamble Mill Restaurant and Brewery wanted to create a space for these local artists. So two years ago, they put in a stage and open mic night was born. We put in this nice stage to be able to do um, live music and stuff, and so it only seemed right to, to do an open mic and let, um, you know, just local talent have a, have a chance to, to venue that, <laughs> to show it off. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of people in this area that have a lot to share, and um, also a lot of people who are interested in um, you know just being around it and enjoying it as listeners too so the venue is the perfect place to get your talents heard it's such a warm space I mean the sounds are warm the the smiles are warm the applause is warm there's just nothing cold or harsh about it you know and that I think it makes it a it makes it a fun place to try and spread those wings and see if there is a star underneath, you know. <laughs> Many artists that hit the stage like to try out their own original music. Well, I like to come out and try stuff like I did tonight. Just try my original songs. I, I like to write songs and come out and uh, lay them out there and see how well they're received. Paul has played many instruments in his day. One of his favorites being the harmonica. The harmonic is not too tough. Uh, it's something that you just, once you pick it up, you kind of get it. You start sucking in on the fourth hole and then try to play around with that and it, it, it just comes to you. I learned how to play it walking to school when I was a junior high school. When it comes to showcasing local music, Gamble Mill doesn't stop at open mic night. They also have scheduled bands every weekend. We've had um, some out-of-town acts, we've had some bigger names come across the stage, and we also really try and focus on, you know, people who are trying to make a profession of music in our own local area. You know, there's a lot of talent in this, in this area, and, um, you know, there's no other way to get your name big except then, you know, going out there and just being heard and letting people share in that music, so. Whether you're a performer or just a listener, the Gamble Mill is the spot for you. There's good food, there's good beer to drink, and there's, you know, all your favorite neighborhood people out to, you know, entertain. So what's not to love? For daily specials, a schedule of events, and more, Check out The Gamble Mill on Facebook. They have live music almost every night with new bands all the time, and their craft beers are pretty tasty. When we come back, we talk holiday shopping. Welcome back to the center of it all. The day after Thanksgiving is one of the busiest shopping days all year, so we brought in an expert to prepare you for the Black Friday attack. Black Friday has been the biggest shopping day in America for decades. And each year it keeps getting bigger and stores are opening even earlier, even some on Thanksgiving. Retail stores would like you to believe Black Friday is like this. Relaxing and you get everything you need. How convenient. When in reality, we know it's more like this and this. But don't worry, we brought in an expert to show you how to survive and thrive on Black Friday. Amanda Benick has been a Black Friday shopper for the past eight years, making sure no sale goes undiscovered. Her recommendations are to shop early and use technology to your advantage. 
Shop online first. Look for um, online ads. Download Black Friday apps. Uh, do it early. That's my only recommendation because a lot of the times the items that you buy on Black Friday aren't necessarily the cheapest on Black Friday. Planning out your day beforehand is key. Have to have a plan. Definitely have an itinerary, have a time frame of how long you're going to spend in each store. If you know the place is opening up at 6 o'clock, you have to allot probably at least an hour and a half before that to wait in line. Because if you're at the tail end wrapped around the store, it's not going to matter if you're there when it's open, they're going to be sold out of whatever you need. Circular ads are a thing of the past. Now you can find any ad on the store app and carry everything you need right in your pocket. When I'm at the store, I use Retail Me Not app to get additional discounts. That will actually map out your current location and tell you what stores are in near you and what coupons are available for that day. We showed you how to get what you want for the price you want. Now get out there and attack those Black Friday deals. If you're looking for a more personalized gift, visit the gallery shop in Lamont for the perfect handcrafted present. Are you looking for more personalized gifts this holiday season? Well, the gallery shop may be the place for you. The shop is nestled at the base of Mount Nittany in the historic village of Lamont. First opened over 20 years ago, the gallery shop is a retail store as well as an art gallery. Behind the scenes, the shop is a collection of 50 local artists who hand make everything in store. From paintings to pottery, woodworking and clothing, you can find it here. Everything is handmade, for one thing. You know, a, a person's soul goes into what they make here. It's not, you know, something that's imported from another country. You know, you won't find it anywhere else. During the month of November, the gallery is filled with fiber art. Practical pieces like clothing, quilts, and accessories. Diane is a longtime artist who can do some pretty remarkable things with silk. I am um, a fiber artist. Um, so I do a lot of double marbled silk scarves, and I'm also a collage artist. Um, so I do a lot of um, paper collage uh, with a lot of dimension. And then I also am a marbler, so I uh, do marbled note cards and uh, various things like that. Sylvia Rushing is the newest fiber artist who got started selling her handbags on the internet. Started out when I was making them for my daughter's school teachers. I gave them as gifts. That was maybe a year and a half ago. And then the shop on Etsy opened in April. Can't find something in the size or color you like? No problem. Anything in store can be customized. If there is a certain style that they want, if they want more floral versus geometric. I typically like to work with prints and so you know I can combine certain prints based on and colors based on request and you know if they want something a little more plain you know that's that's totally fine too. Every item in store is unique and cannot be found at any other retailer. Take advantage of the unique style and that it's something that's handmade by someone, which I think makes it a little more extra special. To see more of Sylvia's bags, check out her store on Etsy. And be sure to visit galleryshop.com for additional information. You can also check out the Gallery Shop on Facebook. Turkey Day is right around the corner, so of course, Mel is cooking up a Thanksgiving feast when we come back. We're back here on the center of it all. Thanksgiving is a holiday based around food. And when it comes to classics like turkey and gravy, Mel has got the perfect recipe. My favorite holiday is here, and I love the pomp and circumstance of preparing my family's Thanksgiving dinner. I've been doing this for over 30 years, so I'm not gonna lie, I'm very good at it. But oh my, do I remember the first year I tried to do it timing the turkey, making the gravy, and those last minute mashed potatoes. It was overwhelming. Today, I'm talking stress-free turkey, easy gravy, and a make-ahead mashed potato stuffing casserole. Let's get started. I've got a 19-pound turkey today. 
This one was frozen and I've thawed it in my refrigerator for about two and a half days. I've rinsed it, patted it dry on the inside and the out, outside, and I've put it on a sturdy rack in a big disposable aluminum pan. Bird is on the rack in a nice big pan, and I've added six cups of chicken stock to the bottom of this pan. It's going to create moist heat as the turkey cooks, which is going to keep the bird from drying out. You don't stuff your bird with cooked or uncooked edible food anytime. Just please don't do it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't put anything in your bird because a bird with an empty cavity is going to dry out. So what am I going to put in it? I'm going to put in what I call aromatics. A couple of sprigs of rosemary, three, sometimes four small stalks of celery, half of an onion, and I like to finish it off with some Granny Smith apple. I've melted about half a stick, three, four tablespoons of salted butter, and I'm going to take all the time that's necessary to paint this bird with butter. This is all the basting you're going to need. Every expert in the world will agree that once your bird browns, basting helps it no way, no how. Another thing um, worthy of note, I've taken my turkey out of the refrigerator about an hour before it's going in the oven because you really don't want to put an ice cold bird in the oven or it'll immediately lower your oven temperature. With any butter I've got left, I'm just gonna pour that over the top. Let it drizzle down into the bird and down into the bottom of the pan. I'm going to give it a really nice, generous grinding of sea salt. And I like the coarse ground salt better than just, say, shaking salt and pepper. And a generous grinding of a peppercorn blend. You can use all black pepper if you like before I put the bird in the oven. I take a sheet of foil and I make what I call a little shield for the breast. And it, I kind of just form it a little bit so that it fits over the top. Now I'm gonna remove this and I'm gonna set it aside. I'm gonna put this bird in the oven at 450 degrees for about 15 or 20 minutes. And when the breast starts to get a really neat golden brown, I'm going to open the oven door, I'm going to put that shield on the breast, which is going to keep it from over browning or burning and drying out the breast meat, and then I'm going to reduce the oven temperature to 350 degrees and let it finish cook. And this one should be done in less than four hours. This is my great Aunt Mary's recipe, and every year at Thanksgiving it was one of my favorite things on the Thanksgiving table. She started with, by baking eight russet potatoes and scooping out the centers, and that'll give you about eight to nine cups of crumbly, smashed russet potatoes. And I actually baked my potatoes last night and scooped out the centers this morning because Thanksgiving is all about organization and getting things done in advance. I sauteed some celery and some onions with some butter, which is classic stuffing ingredients. And I added some poultry seasoning, some parsley, some salt, and some pepper. I'm going to get all of that stirred in. And of course, as our binder, as is in all stuffing, we've got eggs. And I've got four jumbo eggs. You're gonna use six large eggs if you don't have jumbo eggs in your refrigerator. I just quickly whisk those together with a fork. Give these another stir. Now I've got buttermilk here. You can use uh, regular milk if you want, but I really like the tang of buttermilk. I'm just going to add about one cup to start. Now we're gonna start incorporating bread crumbs. And I've got about 14 slices of bread that I ran through the food processor yesterday. 
I'm using potato bread because it's a little bit sweeter than ordinary white bread, and it's what my Aunt Mary always used. The bowl's gonna be really full, and now I'm just going to add my second cup of buttermilk, and I'm gonna stir. But you can see, I still have my container of buttermilk here because two cups is usually enough, but you know, the number of cups of potatoes you get out of eight russet potatoes varies, and 14 slices of bread might give you a few more breadcrumbs here or there. So I always keep this on hand in case I need to uh, moisten this with a little bit more liquid. I put the entire mixture in a nine by 13 casserole that's been sprayed with no stick spray. I'm going to cover it lightly with foil. And I'm going to put this in a 325 degree oven covered for about 45 minutes. Then I'm going to uncover it for about 15 minutes until it gets just lightly browned on the top and puffy in the center. This is not a casserole that you want to have really deep golden brown. That means you've overcooked it. We've got mashed potatoes in here and we want to keep them nice and creamy. Well, my turkey is tented and resting and my mashed potato casserole is in the oven. And I've melted six tablespoons of butter in a skillet here and I've allowed it to get nice and foamy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add like half a cup of pepper, oh, half a cup of flour and a teaspoon of poultry seasoning. I'm not adding any salt and pepper to this, not yet. Now I'm gonna stir this around until it gets really thick and pasty. And this is just called making a roux. So if you hear that term, it's to get the flour nice and smooth and creamy. Keeps you from getting a lumpy gravy if you start with a, a roux. The longer you can stir this without it starting to brown, the less of a, it gets rid of the flour flavor. So we're just gonna let this go for another second. Move nice and fast here. Now I've strained all of those wonderful drippings from the turkey. All of that broth that we put in the bottom of the pan, I ran them through a fat lean separator to get the fat out because we don't need the extra calories or the fat. And I am slowly whisking constantly and I'm just going to bring this to a simmer. I'm gonna keep stirring it almost constantly till it gets thick and smooth. And then I'm going to salt and pepper it to taste. And I'm waiting for the salt and pepper because these drippings are really flavorful from all the salt and pepper and the, from the turkey that already went in there. So we may not have to add any at all. I'm really good with salt, but I'm gonna reach over here and I'm gonna add some freshly black pepper. I'm just gonna put a lid on this and keep it on warm until my casserole comes out of the oven and then it's time to eat. Thanksgiving is all about sharing. Better said, it's all about being thankful for what you're given and sharing it with others, family, friends, and yes, even strangers. We really are all in this food world together, so make the time you've got in your kitchen count. Happy Thanksgiving. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website, Turkey is delicious, but my favorite part of Thanksgiving is definitely the desserts. Coming up, we head out to Tussie to check on the slopes and check in with those trustees at Penn State. Welcome back. Now as the days get shorter and the nights get colder, we look ahead to the snow sports season with Tussie Mountain. The leaves aren't even off the trees and already the folks up at Tussie Mountain are gearing up for the winter season. We have invested a great deal of uh, capital and money into our snowmaking operations where we're basically going to be doubling our capacity of snowmaking. There is no set date as to when the slopes will open, but with their increased infrastructure, that will allow them to make snow even sooner. With our increased snowmaking capacity and uh, what we've been doing in the infrastructure for our snowmaking, uh, we can make snow a little bit warmer than we could before, and we can make it faster. Last year we opened Black Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, and we closed on April 5th, longest season in the history of Tussie Mountain. And last year we made more snow 
than we've ever made in the history of this, uh, this area. Tussie Mountain is also getting you ready for the snow sports season with their annual ski swap. It's one of the biggest winter sport sale systems in central Pennsylvania. We help sell people's uh, used equipment, but then we also do a large buyout of equipment, good equipment. If you just can't wait for the slopes to open, well, you're in luck. Just three years ago, Bennett and his crew created Tussie Mountain all season to become a year-round destination. So we have all different types of recreational type activities, amusement type activities, events, festivals. We have a par three golf course. We have miniature golf. We have a driving range. We have a skate park. We have go-karts. We have a zip line. We have batting cages. So there's a lot of different things going on uh, here during the non-winter season. The skate park, mini golf, and batting cages are known as the Fun Center and are open every day from nine to six. So no matter what time of year you're looking for some fun, Tussie Mountain has got you covered. I can't wait to hit those slopes. Now it's time to check in on the Penn State trustees to see if they finally will review the free report. That's pretty comical, that the trustees would do the job that they were appointed for. $8.2 million for a report that even Ken Frazier calls incomplete. You would think that they want to review it. $8.2 million for a report that pretty well is acknowledged as being, uh, have has holes in it all over the place. You bet it does. I wasn't here when that happened, but I, I certainly would ask for my money back, honestly. Of course the block of 17 says it would reopen the investigation. So what? Are they afraid of something? What it does, though, is have the trustees do something. Through the process, though, it adds to the frustration. Um, you may have heard my last comment, and so what, what does your resolution say? It says we will continue to do what we're doing. One, one doesn't need a resolution for that. And frankly, it tells you there's a difference. We, we want to do something now, they want to stay the course. Whatever that course is, I mean, truly, I, I don't know what that course is and what it, what it will ever accomplish. The opponents of the alumni, meanwhile, yeah, they don't talk. Yeah. I'm standing here trying to get an answer. Yeah, you, yeah. You're not going to answer? No, I'm, I, you're, I'm you're not, not going to You basically ripped apart the free report, and then you said that you're no, not going to review I'm not it. Authorized, That's I'm not authorized to comment. The chair is the one who's supposed to speak on public matters, and that's the, those are the rules of the board. The rules? Since when does that matter? Have you seen the recent email release? And there's more to come. As for the nine alumni elected trustees, yeah, they're just spinning their wheels. There is no such thing as compromise. There's no such thing as negotiation uh, in the, uh, I'll call them the old guard, for lack of a better term, uh, vocabulary, uh, including some of the new Corbett uh, appointees and some of uh, the legislative appointees that, uh, that are on there. They, they don't seem to want to uh, uh, negotiate in any way, shape, whatsoever. Anthony Lebrano and Al Lord really reached way out uh, to Kathy Casey and others to try and reach compromise language. And I saw the uh, email back uh, from uh, Kathy Casey that it was rejected. And so that, that's the world the nine of us live in. All we want to do is get some transparency and truth and, and find out, you know, what really happened. <laughs> Transparency. That's cute, Senator. An upcoming vote has the power block set to limit the alumni seats even further. That's not a joke. Andrew Callista for WHVL. Andrew, no doubt that is a hot topic, and WHVL will keep you updated on any new developments. And that's all for this edition of The Center of It All. Log on to our YouTube page for more great WHVL content and like us on Facebook. Thanks for joining, and have a great day.